you join me in prayer? God, thank you for the gift of this day. Help us, Lord, to receive it. Help open us up, God. Open our eyes so that we might see and open our ears so that we might hear. Open our hearts, God, so that we might feel and know your presence. And then, God, open up our hands so that we might take all that you have given us and go out into the world as your servants. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Forty years ago, uh, Richard Dawkins, the renowned evolutionary biologist, one of the leading voices in the New Atheist Movement, he published his book called The Selfish Gene. And this book kind of popularized the idea that um, the driving force behind everything we do as human beings is preservation of our own personal genetic material. All of our instincts, all of our desires, all of our actions and decisions are at the very root selfish in nature. We are survival machines, is the way he puts it, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. And so it's this evolutionary claim that uh, tries to explain, among other things, uh, why, for instance, parents go to such great and often bizarre lengths on account of our children. We want the best for our kids, Dawkins says, because ultimately we want the best for our genes. So it's the selfish gene that explains why maybe we uh, will repeatedly hit refresh on our computers over and over and over at midnight on the first day of registration for summer camp to make sure that our kid has a spot, right? It's the, shelf, it's the selfish gene that causes us to knock people over in Walmart to grab a Tickle Me Elmo before they're all gone. It's the selfish gene. That's the reason why we send our kids to cotillion. It's all part of an evolutionary scheme, you see, to selfishly ensure that our genes are fit enough and well-rounded enough and happy enough and look good enough in suspenders to make sure that they can carry on to the next generation. Well, as much as evolutionary theory does to account for a great deal of human behavior, one of the things that it still struggles to really fully explain is why anyone would ever show love, care, and concern for someone outside their own immediate genetic circle. I mean, why would anybody uh, put their own resources at risk, their own reputation, their own potential betterment for the sake of someone who doesn't share their chromosomes? Why would we put our own lives in jeopardy to potentially save the life of a neighbor or uh, an, an enemy or a stranger or a group of people who we know that we will likely never even meet? Well, the answer to that question is at the heart of the book of Esther. And the events, the story takes place during the reign of King Xerxes. This is about 500 years before the birth of Jesus. And when Xerxes conquered the Babylonian Empire, he gave the Jewish people who had been put in exile by the Babylonians, he gave them the option to go back home if they wanted to go back home. But while they were in exile for uh, hundreds of years, one of the things that the Jewish people discovered was that God was not confined to the land of Israel, that God was actually alive and present and active all throughout the world. And so when the option came, when the choice came, a lot of the Jews, Esther and her cousin Mordecai included, decided to stay put, to stay exactly where they were. Now, staying put, being in the capital of Persia had a lot of benefits, right? You were in the middle of everything. It was a new empire. There was a lot of stuff going on. There was commerce and business. You were in the middle of it all. That, those were the benefits. But it also put Esther and Mordecai and everybody else in, in rather close proximity uh, to a somewhat um, impulsive, uh, extravagant, uh, unstable king who would dismiss advisors on a whim and, and host elaborate beauty contests to select his next bride and, and pass these absurd royal decrees that could never be reversed. And I know it's weird to think that there was a time when there was a leader who sounded like that, but that was, that was King Xerxes. Some of you got that joke. Some of you are angry about that joke. That's okay. That was King Xerxes. Okay? That's how he was ruling the empire. And and through a series, through a chain of events in the part of the book that we didn't read, 
uh, we see that, that Esther, due to her great beauty and her great charm, she actually wins one of these beauty contests and is named the next queen of Persia. And through another series, Chain of Events, we see that, that Mordecai, due to his stubbornness, found himself to be the catalyst for another one of these uh, odd royal decrees coming from the king, which stated that all of the Jewish people everywhere throughout the empire should be destroyed. And so that kind of brings us up to speed with, with the part of the story that we read this morning. Uh, Mordecai has found out about this new law that has been passed and this upcoming extermination. And Mordecai turns to the only person that he believes has any power to change or do anything about it. He turns to his cousin, Queen Esther. And he writes her a note and he sends her a message and he tells her what the king has done and everything that's about to happen. And he says, look, Esther, if you don't march into the royal throne room immediately, if you don't go and beg for mercy, if you don't go and plead for the life of the Jewish people, then we're going to be wiped out. It's up to you. You're our only hope. And Mordecai is so desperate to get Esther involved in this, to get her to do something that he kind of forgets a couple of pieces of somewhat important information. For one, he forgets that the king still doesn't know that Esther herself is a Jew. Esther followed Mordecai's advice and kept that part of her, of her identity secret, and she has been living kind of in a disguise this whole time. And, and to reveal her identity at, at this point seems like mm, maybe not the best timing to tell the king that you are a Jew. And then the other thing that Mordecai kind of forgets about is that uh, King Xerxes is not the most even-tempered of individuals. And, and so Esther, in her note back to Mordecai, says, Hey, don't you remember the law, the rules around here, that anybody who goes into the throne room uninvited, unless the king extends his golden scepter to them, they are immediately put to death, queens included. Yours truly, your cousin Esther, thanks so much for your advice. Right? That's a lot to ask. It was a lot to ask of someone who throughout her entire life had had, had to do whatever was needed just to survive on her own. We are told earlier in the story that both of her parents died at a very young age. So, so very early on, Esther had to scrap and scrape uh, just to survive in a world that, that was not so kind to orphans. And then when she's made to participate in this beauty contest. She does everything that she can to make sure that she stands out among the rest so that she can win the contest and she can be chosen to be the next queen. And ever since then, living in the palace, she has had to keep her identity hidden, worshiping the Lord in secret so that her ethnicity would not reveal her to be an enemy of the state. Self-preservation making sure that her own genes were okay. That was a game that, that she had learned to play uh, at a very young age, and Esther became a master at it. But now Mordecai is asking her to put all of that on the line. Mordecai is asking her to put her wealth and her royal title and even her very life on the line for the sake of saving God's people from destruction. And here's what he says to Esther. He says, who knows? Who knows? Maybe, perhaps, it was for such a time as this that you came to be where you are. Now, I wonder, I wonder what all of us gathered here, I wonder what we would have done if we had been in the same position. I, I imagine that, that many of us uh, would like to believe that we would have been just as brave as Esther. But we have the benefit of knowing that the story turned out okay. You know, we have the benefit of knowing that that after three days of pious fasting and praying, uh, that she did go into the king's courtroom uninvited against the law, ready to risk her life for the sake of the lives of others. And we know that her plan worked. We know that she was able to speak a little bit of sanity into the mind of the crazy king and that the bad guys eventually lost and the good guys eventually won. We know how the story goes. And so knowing all this makes it a little bit easier for us to imagine that, that we would have been just as brave. We would have been able to be just like Esther and to go into that room and say, if I die, then I die. And I imagine we think that we, we would have been able to be just like David and Rahab, risking their necks to face down the giant or to harbor the Israelites in their home. We like to think that we would have been better than the rich young ruler, right, who was not able to lay down his wealth in order to follow Jesus and gain eternal life, that we would have been better than Peter, who, 
who denied even knowing the Christ in order to save his own skin. Most of us in here, we like to think that when such a time as that comes to us, we'll be able to recognize it for what it is. We'll be able to talk, take stock of, of everything that we have, of all that we're being asked to wager. We'll be able to draw on all the strength of the Holy Spirit, and we will be able to echo Esther's words and say, I'll go, and if I die, then die I will. The problem, of course, at least for me, is that I can take a look back on even just my last week, and I can begin to count the number of times when I was called to offer something far less costly than my life, but found excuses to hold on to it for myself. Pulling up to the, to the top of the exit ramp, I spotted someone who was in need, and there was a voice in my head that said, perhaps you have those $2 in your pocket for such a time as this. And then another voice came into my head and said, eh, perhaps you have those $2 to go get a Frosty and French fries. You've had a long day. You're hungry. You deserve that. A meeting ended a little bit early, and then I considered calling up someone, a member of this church, who I knew has been struggling with loneliness and depression to see if I could go spend a little time with them. And my thought was, perhaps, perhaps I have this extra hour for such a time as this. And then another thought crossed my mind. Perhaps I have this extra hour to go and spend it with Netflix. That's what I'd really rather do. And it seems like every single week, something happens in the world, an event happens in the world upon which I would love to honestly reflect in a Sunday sermon. And the Holy Spirit says, perhaps you have been called to preach for such a time as this. And I say, Holy Spirit, that's a great idea. You know, but perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll just keep quiet on this one keep my job. Wait till the next time. That seems like a better self-preservation strategy for me. And we're all familiar with this feeling, right? We're all familiar with these, this feeling of these opportunities to, to boldly step out and do something that you feel passionate and convicted about, and the opportunities pass us by. Because these opportunities, great and small, to serve the Lord, they, they arise in our life all the time. We open up and look at the newspaper. We look out our car window. We look into our very own homes and we see needs. We look around and we say, well, this, you know, this project over here just needs a little bit more money or that project over there just needs a few more helping hands. We look at people that we know and we say, she could really use a word of hope and encouragement. He could really use just a place to stay for a couple of days until things settle down. They could use some guidance and some wisdom, somebody to just come and spend some time and surround them with love. These opportunities come up all the time. And then in, in a mysterious way, as we're looking at the world and we're looking at these needs, maybe it's a voice in our mind, maybe it's a whisper in the ear, maybe it's a gnawing in our heart, Mordecai shows up. And Mordecai says to us, well, perhaps... Perhaps you have been given your resources and abilities. Perhaps you have been given your experiences, your successes and failures. Perhaps you have been given your wealth and wisdom, your passion and privilege so that you can go and address that need. Perhaps God has made you the way that you are because God needs someone exactly like you for this purpose. Perhaps Everything in your life has happened and led you to this place, and you are where you are for such a time as this. And the trick, of course, is that rarely will these opportunities come in our life, come to us in such a way that we don't have to sacrifice something, like our time, or our resources, or our reputation, or our potential betterment, our chance to make sure that our genes get passed on to the next generation. Rarely do these opportunities come where we don't have to risk something. That's the trick. That's the challenge. The great thing about it is that these opportunities are limitless. These opportunities continue to come into our life. No matter how many times we pass them by, God continues to look at each of us, each one of us, and say, I can use this. I can use you. God can work in a myriad of places and in a myriad ways to make sure that God's kingdom comes on earth.
God can even work through a phone number, for instance. I heard this story just this past week about uh, a group of girls that were gathered together for a sleepover, and they got bored, and they decided it was time to start making some prank phone calls. And that was a shock to me. I didn't know girls also made prank phone calls. That was really, I was really excited to learn that. And so they were gathered around, and one of the girls who was in the group was named Heather, and she said, I know what we should do. We should call whoever belongs to the phone number that spells out my name. Let's call me. Let's call Heather. And so that's what they did. They called Heather at 432-8437. Heather is a second cousin to Jenny. We all know Jenny's number, right? 867-5309. Heather's number is 432-8437. They called Heather, and a man answered the phone. And they did their best to try and upset him and make him angry, and, but no matter what they did, he, he never got upset. He wasn't the least bit angry by the phone call. In fact, uh, these girls now grown up in the interview said that before they hung up the phone, he said, look, if you ever need someone just to listen to you, you can always call me. And so word started to spread throughout this little town that these girls were living in that if you had a problem you could not solve, just call Heather. <laughs> and people did. For 50 years, this town, whenever people in this town had something that they were struggling with, had something they couldn't figure out, they called Heather. And in an interview, they asked Heather, how many times a day would people call and ask for Heather? And he said, well, on a busy day, it got to be about 200 phone calls. Can you imagine that? 200 random people calling to talk to Heather. And so the interview asked him, well, didn't you, didn't you ever feel like changing your number? And here's what he said. He said, well, maybe at first, when it started to happen more and more often, it did seem sort of inconvenient. But then I guess I just sort of decided that maybe I was supposed to have this number. Maybe I was Heather for a reason. And then he went on to say that, that every few months or so, he would get a call from someone who would tell Heather that if it had not been for that night when he had answered the phone and listened to them and talked to them, that they probably wouldn't be here. Can you imagine that? The number of, of neighbors, maybe friends, maybe enemies, people who didn't recognize Heather's voice. Imagine the number of strangers who were saved just because a guy decided Maybe I have this phone number for such a time as this. Maybe I can use this to serve God and serve other people. A phone number. God can work in ways that we would never even imagine. It's true. It's true that we are all genetically predisposed to be selfish to do things that are in our own self-interest. That's just the nature of being human. It would have been perfectly natural for Esther to have refused Mordecai and sought to just save her own life instead of the lives of people she was never going to meet. It would have been perfectly natural for Heather to change his number and decide he was going to focus just on his own concerns, his own life. He was too busy to take care of other people. It would have been perfectly natural to do any of those sort of things. But thankfully, human is not all that we are. Thankfully, there is a supernatural power at work among us, at work in the world. Thankfully, in this mortal body that we have been given, we are also bearers of a divine image. We are carriers of a divine breath. That's, that's the message of Esther. That's why she did what she did. Because she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that same spirit that lived in Esther lives in each of you. It's the same spirit that filled Jesus, who came into this world not to be served, but to serve, to take everything that he had, to offer all that he was, even his very life, for other people. And so I wonder, what, what would Mordecai say to you or to me today or later tonight or next week or five years from now? What would Mordecai have to say to you? 
Could it be that Mordecai would show up into our life? And could it be that Mordecai would say, perhaps you are who you are. Perhaps you have what you have. Perhaps you are exactly where you are for such a time as this. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you work in the most mysterious ways. And we read in the scripture and you you select and choose people to carry out your work and to carry out your will that maybe if it were up to us, we would not choose. That's the foolishness of the gospel. That's where the power comes from, God, that you can take the weak and make us strong. You can take the foolish and make us wise. You can take those who feel like they have nothing at all to offer, nothing to give, and you can turn us into a gift that can change the world. Lord, help us just to be open. Help us to be open to hearing that voice of Mordecai come, maybe when we don't want to hear it, that voice that says, maybe you are who you are. Maybe you've been put into this very place. Maybe you do what you do. Maybe you have the job that you have. Maybe you have the kids that you have. Maybe you live in the neighborhood that you live in. Maybe you are on the board that you were on. Maybe you are here this morning for such a time as this. God, we are your vessels, your instruments. Fill us and use us. So that, Lord, through our lives, through our work, through everything that you have blessed us with, we might become a blessing for others. We might save other people. We might answer the phone and speak to someone who is thinking about ending it. Help us, Lord, just to be be your servant. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. If you're here...